Welcome to episode 137 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Mark Thundercloud, who served in the FBI for nearly 28 years. Early in his career, he was trained as a crisis negotiator and was eventually promoted to the FBI Critical Incident Response Group, CERG, in the Crisis Negotiation Unit. In this episode, Mark Thundercloud reviews the case of an American mother and son, Jerfa and Kevin Lunsman, kidnapped by terrorist organization Abu Sayyaf while visiting relatives in the Philippines. Mark Thundercloud also talks about his role in the rescue from Somali pirates of Richard Phillips, the captain of the Marisk, Alabama, a commercial vessel. During his career, Mark Thundercloud responded to major crisis events around the world and managed the FBI Crisis Negotiator Program and the approximately 375 special agent negotiators throughout the U.S. He also organized many instructional courses and trained hostage crisis negotiation and suicide intervention to thousands of FBI agents, domestic and foreign police officers, and military and other personnel. Mark Thundercloud personally responded to major events in the United States, such as the Ruby Ridge standoff in Idaho, the Freeman incident in Montana, the Boston Marathon bombings, and to the Standing Rock, North Dakota oil pipeline conflict. He has also deployed with the FBI hostage rescue team, HRT, to numerous other arrest and search warrant events, to assist in negotiations of kidnapped Americans and others. Mark Thundercloud deployed to the countries of Afghanistan, Colombia, England, Greece, Haiti, Honduras, Hungary, Nigeria, Pakistan, the Philippine Islands, Qatar, and Trinidad and Tobago, as well as inside the U.S. In 2011, Mark Thundercloud received the FBI Director's Meritorious Achievement Award for negotiations conducted during a piracy-related hijacking off the coast of Somalia. It's another fascinating case review. Before we get to the interview, I just have two quick things. One of them I forgot to tell you about last week, some exciting news. Mike McGowan, who I interviewed in episode 136 about being falsely accused, has had his new book, Ghost My 30 Years as an FBI Undercover Agent, option for a feature film by Sylvester Stallone. Congratulations, Mike. I can't wait to watch the movie. Mike will be back on the show in November. We're going to get together and do a part two covering his undercover assignments with the FBI. So stay tuned for that. Now, the other thing that I wanted you to know is that I highly recommend the CBS show FBI. The show is not for seasoned law enforcement personnel. We are not their core audience. But when I think about a whole new generation of boys and girls watching the show and deciding because of what they see that they may want to grow up to be FBI agents one day, the show gets a thumbs up from me. It's exciting and it's entertaining. Yes, each week I am doing a review blog post, but that blog post is not for people who want to just be entertained. It's for people like you who listen to this show and want to learn about the real FBI. But the show is positive, and I think they're doing a great job of showcasing the FBI's mission to keep Americans safe. And the last thing is my standing invitation for you to join my FBI true crime crime fiction reader team, where once a month I email you a digest of my podcast episodes for that month, my crime fiction recommendations, and I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV and movies, and of course, my own author journey. You can sign up to be a member of my reader team on my website, jerrywilliams.com, and my Facebook page, 
Jerry Williams, author. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Mark Thundercloud. Hi, Mark. Hello. I have had a chance on FBI Retired Case File Review to speak to a number of hostage negotiators, and they've given us some fascinating case reviews. And I think that we are going to have another fascinating case review today. Could you give us a little tease as to what we're going to be learning about today? Yeah, no, no problem at all, Jerry. Hey, thanks for having me again. Yeah, this uh, this case is, uh, we've done a lot of cases, literally thousands of cases now at, at the Crisis Negotiation Unit. Uh, this case was particularly interesting to me, uh, involved a lot of different things, um, uh, international uh, travel, um, which we do a lot of actually. But in this case, uh, the, the uh, it's, it began with our negotiations uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia, then ultimately wound up over in uh, the Philippine Islands where the kidnapping took place. That's basically it in a nutshell. It, it, uh, it went on for months and there was a lot of ups and downs. And ultimately, uh, um, you know, as uh, the listeners will, will learn uh, a happy ending. Good to know because we love happy endings. Well, I want to just kind of set, set the scene. I guess one of the first things that everyone needs to know or, or at least be reminded of is how the FBI gets involved in a kidnapping that occurs in the Philippines. How does that happen? How does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and most ordinary people don't really know how, how we get involved in, in, in those types of cases. Everybody as an American citizen has certain rights, uh, whether wherever they travel around the world. So in this case, uh, there was a kidnapping uh, that occurred. Again, no matter where it occurs in the world, the U.S. citizen is protected by uh, semi are protected by a statute that makes it a crime to do that against U.S. citizens. And, and, and kidnapping is one murder, and there are some other crimes that, that are covered under a legislative statute. So that's how we uh, get involved. It, it is a crime against uh, a, a U.S. citizen, and the crime is investigated by the FBI primarily uh, with the help of, uh, obviously, a local law enforcement and, and, and maybe other entities in the, in the U.S. government. And then ultimately, it can be prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, here in the States. And when I first started doing this, you know, um, shoot, almost 30 years ago now, uh, there was very few that were actually prosecuted and where subjects, uh, criminals were extradited from different countries back to the U.S. here. But now, in this day and age, and it's gradually progressed to the point where we are uh, a lot of times routinely extraditing people if we can get our hands on them back to the U.S. for prosecution. So really, that's how that's how uh, the American public is is uh, kind of protected by these types of crimes and how we get involved in, in in the investigation and prosecution of people who commit these crimes. Now, how prevalent is this that there is a kidnapping of an American citizen overseas? Well, in, in the 90s, uh, it was a handful. You know, um, it didn't really that happen that often. It really start to, started to take off in the early 2000s. Uh, and, and, and during the 2000s, there were many, many citizens uh, kidnapped um, in Haiti uh, for a while. There were having hundreds a year of American uh, citizens kidnapped there in, in Iraq, in the Middle East, Afghanistan, all these places where obviously... Criminals are um, are allowed basically, and have the and have the the means to to um, prey on innocent people, and and that they're not only Americans; they're they're anybody really, anybody that that kidnappers are um, a target and and can exploit and raise funds um, through this uh, through kidnapping. So, uh, and right now, really, the hot spot uh, has and has been for the last few years is Mexico. Mexico, there's a lot of U.S. citizens that are still being kidnapped and. And a lot of them are Mexican Americans, and you know that have family here and have family there, and go back and forth, and they're targeted by by criminals who are motivated largely by money. And so these are all are mainly kidnapping for ransom, and Absolutely. and I know that we don't like to. I, I used to work bank robberies early in my career, and we never like to tell people the amount of money taken during a bank robbery. But I think we need to get a, a kind of an idea of at least what they ask for. I know 
in many situations, the amount of money that they're asking for this ransom is way over the means of the you know the families of the people that are are being kidnapped. But can you get, can you give us an idea of how much these ransoms are for? It really depends on the area. For example, in Haiti, you know, the a, a typical ransom uh, that was paid uh, could be as little as a few hundred dollars up to maybe twenty thousand dollars. You know, and, and and usually in the low thousands, maybe two, three thousand, maybe four thousand. That would be a a typical ransom that was that was paid in, in Mexico. Kind of a similar thing, but it really depends on it. Really depends on how sophisticated the uh, kidnappers are in that who they targeted. If they know they've they've targeted a a wealthy business person or a business person in general, rather than just, uh, you know, somebody, a tourist off the street or whatever it might be, they they do their homework. A lot of these kidnapping groups have a lot of experience and, you know, and and then unfortunately they do their homework and and they're able to come up with a decent number uh, and have a ballpark figure as as in in their minds as, as far as what the, what the person is worth. Uh, in this case that we're going to talk about, um, there were some things that led the kidnappers to believe that there was more money that this family had, um, and that that kind of hindered um, a lot of progress that that normally would have taken place. And I can get into that uh, shortly, but really, it depends on where the kidnapping occurred and who the victim is, and how how well the kidnappers uh, did their homework regarding the victim. All right. Well, I think we have enough background now to. I'll, you know, allow everyone to understand what's going on as you know we begin this case review. So, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about the victims? Sure, sure. The the victims, um, uh, Jirfa and Kevin Lunsman, resided uh, or do reside in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is eh, maybe maybe two or three hours drive uh, south of uh, where I where I worked at the time at Quantico, Virginia. So it, it was convenient for us in that we could drive and, you know, visit and, and work with the family without too much effort. So what, what happened is uh, in, in July, uh, specifically on July 12th, uh, Jirfa and Kevin were in the Philippines um, visiting some relatives. Jirfa is a Filipino-American and still has relatives in the Philippines. And she had routinely, well, I don't want to say routinely, but she had uh, on previous occasions been to the Philippines to visit with her family at, at least, I don't know, at least several times um, you know, in the past. And she had she'd taken Kevin with her so Kevin could, you know, could visit with the relatives there and, and get to know the people, get to know a, a bit of his heritage his father is a person by the name of Heiko Lunsman, and Heiko is a German uh, American, and um, so he stayed behind in, in Lynchburg while Kevin and Jirfa went went to visit their uh, relatives in the Philippines. So they're there for a period of time, and uh, on the the night before they were to return to the states, uh, they're visiting their relatives in the, the southern part of the Philippines. And, and and I'm gonna just go into a little bit about the Philippines. One of the side one of the side things that we learn <laughs> um, by necessity is a lot about the areas where these kidnappings occur. I didn't know too much about the Philippines, a little bit, but um, not not having uh, be, been there to visit or, or not having uh, uh, prior deployments there, I didn't know a lot about the Philippines. But when this happens, you kind of you kind of learn a lot. So. The, the, a little bit about the Philippines. It's uh, um, there's a there's like thousands of islands. There's like seven thousand islands, and the population is 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 pretty is pretty large for a, a smaller country. It's got eighty four million people, roughly, and probably more by now. And um, religious wise, it's uh, largely overwhelmingly Catholic, uh, over eighty percent, and and there's another ten percent that are that are Protestant, and about five percent are are the Muslim religion. And in the southern part of the Philippines, on, on the island of Mindanao and, and south, that's where these that's where the, the, the Muslims are. And and what's been happening there for decades now is uh, there's been an insurgency there that started again, shoot, probably 40 or 50 years ago, with this Muslim uh, sect, a Muslim um, radical Muslims, I, I probably would would say, that want to break away from the Philippines and form their own autonomous region. And in fact, that's kind of what it is right now. There's been 
uh, groups that have formed, and, and one of them is the Abu Sayyaf, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of people probably heard of Abu Sayyaf, and at the time, they affiliated and sided uh, with uh, the, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda. So that's a little bit of, of, of who, are, who are the people that we're dealing with and ultimately that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, now the Abu Sayyaf has sided with uh, Islamic State. They've kind of, you know, went, went that route. Uh, but at the time, they were, they were affiliated with Al-Qaeda. So, so on the night before they were, they were due to leave, they're down on this tiny little island um, south uh, of Mindanao, actually off the shores of Mindanao, a little island called Tiktaban. And uh, during the early hours of, of that night, the kidnappers, the Abu Sayyaf group, they came on inflatable boats and basically took uh, Jirfa and Kevin and one of their cousins, Jakariah, took them at gunpoint, rousted them from their sleep, and then took them in the boats and then uh, drove south to the island of, uh, of Basilan. And, and Basilan is one of the islands where the Abu Sayyaf has their, has their, you know, basically, I don't want to say it's a stronghold, but that's where they operate from. Uh, and an island south of that, there's several others that, that they, they occupy, but um, they, they took them to Basilan. Why yeah. them? Why them? Why yeah, them? that's a really good question. And, and, and what we find is, uh, what we find, Jerry, in a lot of these cases, unfortunately, uh, either family members, friends, anybody that knows about uh, specifically Americans uh, that are visiting, and we've seen this in other places, not not just the Philippines in this case, but we've seen it in Mexico, we've seen it in Haiti, we've seen it in the Middle East, where anybody that has information about people of value, that information can be sold. Now, we don't have proof that um, that that the information was sold, but we do have strong indicators that somebody tipped off um, Abu Sayyaf into, into who Kevin was, who Jerfa was, and that they could be of value. So, yeah, that's a very good question. And we think that's how, that's how, that's how they, were, um, they were abducted, and that's how Abu Sayyaf learned of their location and everything else and, and was able to, to you know, to, to, to abduct them. And take them away. Um, it, it just again the night before they were supposed to leave. All that you know was kind of in our minds fishy, right? So, so um, that that's uh, that that's probably what happened. Someone knew that they were there. Obviously, uh, maybe people even close to them, um, or or knew, or or they mentioned to someone else who who then passed on the word to the to the kidnappers. So. Yeah, it, it kind of sounds like maybe somebody bragged that they had rich relatives from America visiting. Yeah, I mean that that's that that could be that that certainly could be. And in what and what Jirfa do, does, and she you know she has photos, uh, she shows people photos. And look, uh, the, uh, the Lundsmans were in no way what we would call wealthy. Uh, you know, from our standpoint, they were uh, solid middle class. Uh, you know, but in, in the in the people that they're visiting, in their eyes, who literally have don't have running water, and you know, and might have spotty electricity and, and things like that. I mean, they're they're rich Americans, and the perception of a lot of people around the world is that every every American is a millionaire, and and really, maybe relatively speaking, that they are compared to how, how a lot of people live in the world. So, so um, in, in their eyes, anyway. Uh, they certainly, they certainly knew that Jeff and Kevin were doing much better than economically and and how they were living uh, than they were. So, yeah, it it, it really um, that that's how a lot of these things begin, unfortunately. Now, I know you said Kevin was. I, I think you mentioned, or either I read that Kevin was fourteen. How old was the cousin? Uh, the cousin was uh, shoot. I have to. He's. A little older than Kevin, I'd have to go back and, and look at notes, but he was a teenager. He was a teenager, probably 17 or 18, if I can recall. And I can, I can get that data for you if it's necessary, but um, he's a little bit older than Kevin. So, you know, they, they kind of, they've known each other and they kind of pal around together. And, but they all were taken. And, you know, the thing is, uh, the kidnappers didn't really want <laughs> to take the cousin. Uh, he kind of forced himself upon them, uh, thinking that maybe he's going to try to be a protector, thinking that wherever they go, I'm going to go. But um, he kind of went along for the ride. Maybe that's a, a, a fitting description. He, he, he 
he just inserted himself into the into the equation because he's not really worth anything in the eyes of uh, Abu Sayyaf as far as financial um, gains. But he wow, he well, yeah, yeah, it's very brave, very courageous of him to do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So anyway, the the three the three now are off, and that's basically how it started. They're they they're taken across the, the the I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the mileage probably 10 15 maybe 20 miles uh to get to Basilan. I did go to Basilan later on to uh, and I'm trying to recall um how far it was uh yeah I want to say maybe 10 to 15 miles uh, Jerry that that's the the distance from from where they were taken uh to Basilan. But anyway they're carted they're carted there by boat and um, then this this whole deal begins. Uh, the the remaining relatives that were there in Tiktaban they alert the authorities, and ultimately uh, ultimately uh, the trick the the information gets to the U.S. embassy, embassy and then uh, then there's some protocols that take place where uh, where we ultimately were uh, notified. So so now we have a uh, uh, Kevin and, and Jirfa abducted, more than likely. Uh, by Abu Sayyaf, uh, that's that's their method of operation. That's their that's their area of operation, and it turns out that that it is them. They're not. And, and the other thing about Abu Sayyaf is we we had in the early two thousands we had some pretty high profile cases that occurred there that other retired negotiators from our, our crisis negotiation unit worked and deployed to Philippines on the. I don't know if you remember the Burnham. There's a there's a couple of missionaries the Burnhams that were taken there. Um, one, the, the husband, Burnham, he was ultimately killed during a rescue attempt. And there was another person uh, that was taken there, a business person who ultimately uh, was uh, executed. So, I mean, these folks have been doing kidnapping for, shoot, at least 20, 25 years um, to, to raise funds primarily, but also for political, political means if it benefits them uh, in that way. Anyway, so, so Kevin and Jerfa are uh, are abducted they're on you know they're on Basilan now and uh, we get involved and the first thing we do uh, as a nego- as as a, you know working from the negotiation unit we try to get people to the uh, negotiators that are in the area to the houses of the uh, the people that are logically going to receive uh, potential ransom calls and in this case again uh, the Lunsmans were from Lynch- Lynchburg Virginia and we we did have some negotiators out of our Richmond division uh, go to uh, Lynchburg and and meet with uh, Heiko, and that's what happened uh, initially. And to get them set up for some potential calls. And again, luckily for us, it was uh, it was close to where I worked at the time at Quantico, at our FBI academy. And so I drove down and also met Heiko um, pretty early on in in, in, the, in the kidnapping. Uh, and that's what uh, and that's what happened. And uh, I'm just going to go into now how we kind of prepare uh, the families for for what's about to happen or what we've seen happen. What's you know what logically um, is is going to occur with them. Obviously, the family is uh, is going to be distraught. Is going to be saddened, anger, whatever, whatever emotion you can you can con- you can conjure up. Uh, that that's what they go through. And one of our primary jobs as negotiators when we're dealing with, with the family is to try to inject some type of uh, calmness, try to, um, you know, de-escalate whatever emotions they might be having and, and prepare them to communicate with the, uh, with the bad guys. Our standard operating procedure for the U.S. government is typically we don't, we don't get on a phone with these, with these uh, um, kidnappers. Uh, uh, one is, one is, you know, we, we would be inviting um, a potential problem if we were to be found out that we were working for the government. That's one. The other is uh, the government really can't represent the family in any decision-making process because that's not what the government does here in the U.S. And third, we'd have to begin the negotiations with a lie, which is what we really try to avoid. So we have to initially try to calm, contain their emotions a little bit, and then, and then try to work with them uh, to, to, you know, to the future uh, in dealing with these, uh, with these kidnappers. So with that, let me, let me ask you a question. How honest were you 
and explaining to Heiko Lundsman who these kidnappers are and what they've done in, in the past as far as, you know, assassinating and executing past kidnap victims. I mean, how much did he know? How much were you, when you were saying you were preparing him, I understand you were preparing him for contact, but did you give, the, give him any information about who he would be dealing with? What we try to do is, is try to be completely transparent with the family the best that we can. And 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 we've learned that it's uh, for one thing. For one thing, um, we we have to build trust. If Heiko, well, let me step back a little bit. When when the initial FBI personnel got to Heiko's house, he could have said no. He he could have said no. You're not coming in. No. So it, they don't. <laughs> these families, they're not bound to to invite us into their house. They can say no. I'll handle it. No. I'll do this. No. I'll do that. Um, I'll take care of it on. I'll take care of it on my own, and, and so we're not really. We don't have. Uh, we can't force our way into these people's lives and help them if they don't want the help. Obviously, most of the time they do want the help, but there have been other times when, yeah, we started, but then they they might get a private, you know, private security to to work their cases. You know, that's happened. Not not too often, but it has happened. But in this case, Heiko uh, being a, a very a very common citizen, you know, you're talking about normal people here. We're not talking about business people with insurance and all this other stuff. We're talking about a normal family in a, in a, in a middle-class town, uh, you know, so we're talking about, uh, you know, like our neighbors basically. Right. Yeah. But why would somebody, even if they were a business person or they had money, why would they want a private security person to handle this I mean, they have to know that the FBI has done this before, has been there before. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised why, why somebody, even if it's rare, wouldn't want the FBI to assist them. Well, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people that are taken that who have uh, insurance, uh, part of the insurance includes uh, a security consultation. So, you know, if you're working for IBM or some other company, it doesn't pick your company, right? And if you're traveling here or there, you go to Columbia, you go to some some other places where kidnappings have occurred, and you know it's a little risky. And you're taken, you're insured, but with that insurance, usually comes consultation from security firms. Uh, and, and look, even if that happens, usually the FBI still has access and still is welcome in a lot of their. Um, what do I want to say? A lot of their, their meetings, a lot of their whatever it might be. Um, it, we, we might be out of it when it comes to possibly negotiation, but there's a couple avenues that the FBI has in this. One is the, one is the investigation, and there's a case agent that's assigned to investigate it and you know, take it through uh, any of the potential prosecutions, you know, interviewing witnesses, um, collecting evidence, all those things that the, that the investigator handles. And then there's the actual negotiations that occur that we would advise that that, that our unit w- would be a part of and then advise regarding strategies, regarding suggestions, talking points, those types of things. We do work hand in hand with the investigation, obviously. And, you know, we gather evidence through through recordings and, and everything else. But uh, the point is, the point is, in this case, in this case, obviously, Heiko did not turn us away. And again, it doesn't happen that often. But again, the bottom line is that a family does not have to allow the FBI into their house. That, that's, so one of the things we try to do, obviously, is build trust, right? You have to, you have to uh, gain trust. And, and one of the ways we do that is to be honest with them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, the initial question is, how do we prepare them for the worst? And we just do. We just tell them. There's no, there's no guarantee in this thing. You're probably dealing with a group that has this past, that they've, they've done these terrible things before. But on the other hand, we can tell them that the vast majority of these cases, I don't care where it occurs in the world, are about financial uh, motivations. People want money. People view, uh, um, in this case, they viewed Kevin and and Jurfa as big piles of money. They think, well, all right, I see these people. Uh, They have value. I don't know them. I'm going to take them and hopefully I can trade them for things that I value, and that's that's financial gains. So uh, unless there's a, unless there's some type of relationship involved in the people that are taken, um, that's how the vast majority of these cases, uh, uh, you know, turn out. They turn out 
well. They turn out the people are released um, in the vast majority of cases, not all obviously, but, but in the vast majority of the cases, they, it, it, you know, there is a, there is a happy ending. Um, it's going to cost somebody something, uh, usually in the form of money, but um, that's, how, that's how it happens. It's all about trust and that's what we have to build. So we're honest with them as, as far as we can be. And we'll be honest with them about what we, can, what we can tell them. Because when it comes to the investigation, when it comes to certain methods that we use in, in investigations, we can't, we, can't be, uh, we, we can't tell them everything that we're doing uh, in that regard. And we were upfront about that as well. So that's what we try to do anyway. And, and hopefully we can gain their trust and, and, uh, and help them. Because ultimately, ultimately, we all want the same thing. We want to we want to help this family through the crisis and get their loved ones back, right? So that that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. So you're preparing Mr. Lundsman while you know his wife and his son and and their cousin are being held. You know, there's like two scenes, and I don't know how you're going to be able to help us visualize this, but how long were they being held before he gets the first phone call? And my other question is, what type of situation were they being held in? All right. So um, in, in cases involving this type, this type of group or, you know, you can, you can go back to the, you know, the FARC, uh, the Revolutionary Armed Forces in Colombia in their heyday, uh, you, know, you know, in the late 90s and 2000s when they kidnapped people. Um, basically what happens, uh, and it happened in this case, the, the group that is taking them basically goes back to their camps. They are literally camping out in the forest. Uh, and in there, you know, they built a little shelter um, for, for Kevin, uh, his cousin and his mom. And basically they lived with the, with the group. Um, you know, if you're talking about urban environment, you know, could be different. Uh, they're going to be maybe housed in a, a safe house or whatever it might be. But in this case, with these guerrilla groups, uh, they're literally camping with them uh, and traveling with them through the jungle. And, you know, uh, if you can just imagine yourself being taken, you know, we, we live in here in the States and now all of a sudden we're in a, some type of, uh, you know, tropical jungle in the middle of nowhere and some tiny island that you have no clue where you are. And, you know, if you could just imagine how helpless uh, you would feel. So basically, that that's what's happening. So they're traveling through the jungle and living with them as they as they move about. And they moved a couple times during their their captivity. Again, we're going back to July 12th. That's when it happened. Early mornings of July 12th, and then uh, and this is uh, 2011. And, and so we're, we we get to uh, we get to the Lundsman's uh, residence, and and we're you know talking with uh, we're talking with Heiko, and now really it becomes a waiting game. On the 14th, two days after the initial kidnapping, he does get two calls uh, between 4 and 6 a.m., and that's the Lynchburg, Virginia time, and, and now this thing kick, gets kicked off. So on the 14th, uh, an initial call is there, and I'm not there at this time. I'm not, uh, I'm not there for this call. He, he calls, and he says that, and this is, uh, this is not verbatim, not all of it anyway, but and the kidnapper says, we would like to inform you that your family is here. Your family is in his custody, and uh, they have demands for the re- release of the family. And this is where it kind of floors uh, floors Heiko a little bit. Uh, he demand he's demanding ten million U.S. dollars. Um, and Lundsman, ten million, yeah, ten million. And and Heiko kind of he's taken aback by that amount. Obviously, I mean Heiko is a Heiko is a, a maintenance person. This guy does not have a lot of money at all, and 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 um, Sherfa works at a hospital, so I mean they're just normal people getting by, right? And Heiko thinks that he says two million dollars, and he's not a rich man, and uh, you know things of those uh, things, things like that. And and we we prepped him to a degree. We did have problems a, a little bit with Heiko, not his attitude at all. His attitude was great. And I'm going to back up a little bit because one of the things I failed to mention is we have to identify with the family the person who's going to be the primary communicator. Kevin's got a half brother. Um, Jerp has got another son that is uh, was in university at the time, and we thought about using him, but uh, and he would he would have been excellent. But the problem with using him was that he was in the middle of studies, and when we when we talk about identifying a communicator in these cases, 
the person has to be ready, available at all hours of the day or night. And really, the only person that, that really could have, have done that was Heiko, because he was there, obviously. Uh, he was he got off work. He was allowed to, you know, um, take work off and, and deal with this uh, situation. So Heiko was really the, the only logical person that we could have used. But, but the problem with Heiko was that he's had a strong German accent. So now we have this Filipino guy calling who's got a strong Filipino accent. And now we have um, Heiko uh, talking with him, who's got a strong German accent. So practically speaking, a lot of times they didn't know what they were talking about. I could hear and listen, and, and whoever was with Heiko at the time could, could, could hear what was going on, and we'd pass notes to, to try to clarify things. But at the super of the moment, a lot of times Heiko didn't understand him, and vice versa. The, the, you know, the, the kidnapper could not understand Heiko either. So we were dealing with some very basic communications issues that were sometimes, you know, created a problem. There was a lot of repeating, uh, which isn't bad. I mean, we like to have, you know, people repeat things to, to clarify, but a lot of times they weren't connecting, if you know what I mean. So right off the bat, the first call is a demand for 10 million. Heiko think it's 2 million. So, you know, and we didn't really catch that discrepancy until after we listened back to the recording of the conversation. And again, one of the things that we do, uh, we try to record everything so we can go back and review and then use as evidence and everything else. So we were able to, you know, to, to catch that problem. So there's this discrepancy right from the beginning. The um, kidnapper also said that he was planning uh, to uh, have some ATM or I'm sorry, have some accounts ready uh, for, for Heiko and that, you know, he was, depo- he was to deposit the money into certain accounts. And then they were would be accessible um, in the Philippines. The kidnapper also tells uh, tells Heiko not to tell anybody, you know, uh, about the call, not to tell, not to inform the Philippine government. And then he kind of threatens in an indirect way: uh, if you tell the government, their lives will be in danger. You should remember that. Did you get my point? Type of thing. And that's pretty routine to uh, inform the victim's family, not to alert authorities. Obviously, so that was out there. And basically, that's uh, that's a, that's the gist of the call. There was some back and forth. You know, again, they had pro- trouble communicating and understanding. Call lasted about eh, total, maybe five minutes. So that that's how it kicked off, uh, as far as the calls were concerned. I think it would be uh, very interesting to to hear how you you know record everything because I take it there's you know you're not even sure what phone they're going to use. Right. I'll, uh, I'll explain how that works. So one of the things that, uh, one of the things that we try to do is, is record all the conversations and Sherfa and Kevin have the phone numbers of, of Heiko, right? So what we try to do in this case, the Lundsman's had a hard line as well and Heiko had a cell phone. So what we try to do is, uh, try to set it up where, you know, both phone lines are covered by recordings and we, we do have some equipment that allows us uh, it, it's handheld equipment that we're able to take with us to these uh, to the victim's family's residences and set up and and it allows a couple things. It allows us to record the conversation. Uh, it also allows uh, uh, people to listen in on the conversation and provide real time guidance to to in this case Heiko uh, as the call is progressing. So if Heiko misses something, and a lot of times he did, one of us would would pass a note to Heiko, and, and if if we could. Uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult logistically when during a conversation, but if we, if we needed to, we would pass him a, a note and then he would maybe revisit the issue and, and try to cl- clarify things. So that's one of the things we try to do. And, and again, uh, the recording is for a couple of things. One, obviously, is so we can review it to make sure uh, what, was, what we thought was said was said or, to, or for clarification purposes. And the other thing is to... Uh, is for evidence. You know, it's good to have evidence of people calling and extorting another person. So it's used by uh, the investigation uh, and the prosecution of, of these folks. All right. So he gets this initial call and he thinks they're asking for 2 million. They're asking for 10 million. Does he explain to them that he doesn't have 10 million? Yeah. And in this case, it, it set up perfectly uh, for him to be honest Sometimes, you know, look, we strive for honesty, even, even if we, even if when we're dealing with these uh, bad folks, the kidnappers, 
um, he didn't have to, he didn't have to fudge on what he had. He didn't have to, uh, um, he didn't have to um, a lie or even think about lying in his case because he had nowhere close to $10 million, let alone $2 million, you know, or $2 million, let alone $10 million, however you want to put it. But the fact of the matter is, again, he's, he, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck like a lot of people are in this country and they don't have that type of money. Um, one of the things that, that we thought played a part in this, though, and, and it happened right in the beginning, the local media found out about, and I can't for the life of me remember how that happened. But regardless, it did happen. And they, they sent crews out to the Lundsman's house very, very early. And one of the videos that was aired on, on television was Heiko pulling up to his house in a Mercedes Benz. Well, again, this happened in 2011. Heiko's German, and his, his dream was, all, uh, was always to have a Mercedes Benz, and it was a convertible on top of it, uh, convertible. So from a viewership standpoint, they see this guy pulling up into, uh, into this house, and they do have a circular driveway. And it, it circles around their house, but the house is, is very modest. Um, it's not palatial by any means. Uh, it's just in a regular neighborhood with a you know a little bit bigger lots than most, but it's it's not it's kind of a rural setting, but it is not uh, it's it's not you know lavish or expensive or anything like that. But but anyway, the news shows him pulling up and in, pulling into this driveway, and he does have bushes out front. Well, it it looks on the, you know from the video like this guy is loaded. Well, this is like a a ten year old car, you know he always wanted one. It was not like a brand new, a brand new vehicle at all. But you know, we started thinking about that, and that that made the news, and it was online the whole thing. And these these people, uh, these people that that kidnap, you know, in this case, I'll, I'll get into who they were, but um, they're not they're not stupid, you know. They're they're very savvy with, with you know with uh, the internet and everything else. So we're thinking that they probably saw him pull up in this car and thinking that he's got a lot more money than he's, that he's letting on. So uh, we think that's one of the reasons why it, it, it in a, in, in, and as you'll see, or as you'll hear, um, the negotiations kind of stalled because there was always a chasm into the perception of, of what, you know, what the Lensmans had as far as, you know, their finances were concerned. That came into play and that happened right up front. So I think, I think um, that that was an issue during the negotiations, because we, as you as you hear, we didn't really get anywhere with negotiations. So anyway, we we get the you know we get that first call on the 14th, and it's going to be the same message the whole time, really, that he doesn't have a lot of money. They're demanding more money, um, and it it really goes around in circles like that for for the whole time. Uh, Jerry, uh, they were taken in July, and this case wasn't resolved until December. We really didn't make any progress when it came to negotiation, aside from uh, establishing some proof of life that, that we got over, you know, over the course of the, of the negotiations. Uh, the first one, the first one came on the 16th. And again, uh, that's four days later. The kidnapping occurs on the 12th. They have the conversation on the 14th. And then the next conversation involves proof of life call where Heiko is actually able to speak with with uh, with Jirfa. And Kevin, and again, they're they're, they're trained, you know, they're trained to t to tell Heiko get the money, get the money, and um, you know he's under pressure now. And after the sixteenth, uh, after that call, we receive calls every day until the twenty second. Uh, so from the sixteenth to the twenty second, we're getting calls every day. I'm going to get into now ransom and who makes that decision and and how um, and how it happens. Well, in this case, well, in all cases, um, if the family chooses to pay a ransom, that's completely up to them. The U.S. government has no say uh, or doesn't condone or approve ransoms. All we do is try to provide guidance um, as to maybe the, the amount of, of ransom that's paid and maybe how it's delivered. And if we can exploit in any way the ransom payment um, in further of the investigation, so uh, Heiko agrees to pay an amount, um, and and he does uh, deposit the the money into some accounts that they give him, and um, and that's what occurs. I'm not really going to say the amount that was paid, uh, but 
but he didn't he did make a payment on the 22nd uh, against we, we 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 didn't really want him to make that payment but in his mind he felt he needed to do that and it's understandable because his wife and and son are you know are under stress and so was he so he felt the need to do that so he did but we were later able to obtain some some uh, decent information uh, in the Philippines uh, in in the identification of these folks. So so we exploited it to the best of our ability. But he did make a payment that we really didn't want him to make. But again, it's totally understandable what these families are going through. We really can't make them not pay. And if they do decide, then we try to we try to um, give them the best guidance that we can. Just for everybody's clarification, why? Don't you want them to pay the ransom? Well, in this case, we didn't so early. I'm going to take a step back. We didn't want them to make the payment that early. Let's put it that way. Because if you make payments early, uh, in a lot of these cases, it, it doesn't lead to the resolution, okay? It just leads to more more ransom demands of more payments. And that's what happened here. Um, there was no agreement that they were going to release them. So, I mean, what's the point of making a ransom payment if uh, there really is no agreement, right? So uh, Heiko felt in his mind that if he made the payment, they would release him. But um, that wasn't the case, and it was not really a true agreement for that to happen. So um, that's why. That's why. And and the fact that they're, you know, they're making threats. They're, they're still threatening. And, and so he felt pressure to do something. Um, so a lot of times... You know, this, the family does, they, they do things that we necessarily don't want them to do. But again, we, you know, we, it's their decision. If we had solid guarantees that we, they would release them, maybe. But you got to remember, this is, uh, this is 10 days into the kidnapping. And we're dealing with a group that we've known has held hostages for months, years at a time. So it's unlikely that they're, and we didn't have, a, we didn't, we weren't there yet where they were re- willing to release them. And pl- plus the, I mean, the initial demands were in the millions and, and uh, the payment that was made, was made was minuscule compared to that. So yeah, we just didn't think that was, uh, they were going to release them. So anyway, so, but he does, he does make the payment. We use it to the best of our advantage and it's, it's done. So anyway, that, that, that happened on the 22nd of July. The next call is the 24th, then there's 26, 27, and then it gets into August. And um, really nothing's, uh, nothing substantial is happening. Uh, again, we're, we're going back and forth. They think he's got a lot of money. He says, I don't have a lot of money. And, and we're, really, we're really spinning our, our wheels here. We're really spinning our wheels. One one of the things that we're also doing is, um, you know, I'm not going to get into real specifics, but there are other people working on this uh, on this case aside from aside from the FBI. So there, there's folks uh, that are um, that 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 are working uh, behind the scenes, um, uh, trying to identify, you know, uh, phone numbers and you know things like that. And you can read into it what you want, but but there are other things happening aside from the negotiations. Right, I would imagine yeah. that it is also an opportunity for intelligence gathering. Absolutely, absolutely, and you know, and they're you know, and we're exploiting we're exploiting some of the electronic things that are happening. And luckily for this case, in other cases, this, this doesn't happen. But we do have a really good work, working relationship with the Philippine government. Um, we have people in, we have an FBI people embedded close to where this is happening. We have military folks embedded close to where this is happening. So, yeah, there, there's other things happening uh, aside from the negotiations that, that are helping. But still, they're holding all the cards. They have, they have Kevin and Jerfa, you know, in the middle of the jungle. We don't know, really know they, where they are. There's Filipino military operations that are occurring there pretty regularly. And that's one of the things we kind of worry about is what's happening behind the scenes. And these aren't, the, and the other thing is these aren't, uh, Kevin and, and Jerfa aren't the only people that are being held. So that that's the that's the other thing. There there are other kidnap victims out there, um, and, and there are other things going on as well. But again, the bottom line is we're not we're not the only people working uh, this case. All right, so I'm going to go back. Uh, you mentioned Romanik. Romanik was uh, uh, Romanik Shakaria. That that's the cousin. He was 19 at the time. So I'll go back and hit on that. I'm just going through some notes here. A permanent um, investigator was assigned. 
um, from the Rich- Richmond division, who then you know was a liaison between the, well, our Washington field office, who ultimately had the prosecutorial responsibility and overall investigative responsibility. But we have a local resident agent in Lynchburg who's also kind of the case agent uh, locally. So he's there. He's he's visiting you know regularly, but we also are there on a permanent basis. Uh, the negotiation team. And what we do over extended cases like this, we bring in negotiators from really around the country a lot of times because it can tax a local uh, negotiation and they can't be there the whole time. So we start rotating, uh, making up schedules, and we bring in negotiators from, in this case, from as far away as Los Angeles to to spend time at the Lundsman residence and in the areas. So in, in our rotation schedule is usually three weeks. So um, we we have we established this uh, this rotation schedule and and we are working with Heiko. We're there every day during a, um, a specific time frame, waiting for calls. And that's another important thing we do organizationally is that we try to steer calls towards certain time frames, so we don't have to be in the residence twenty four hours. So and we did that. It was uh, it was like. 5 to 10 a.m. local time in Lynchburg. That's when we were there. That's when we were ready to take the calls. And a vast majority of calls uh, came at that time. And, and what we try to do is we tell a, we tell a kidnapper, say, look, we're gonna, I'm going to be here between this time and this time. If you call another time, I might not be here. So we're trying to, uh, you know, over, over uh, several conversations, we're directing the kidnappers to call between a certain time so we can be at least ob- obtrusive to the family as possible. I, I take it that you've given instructions to Mr. Lunsman that if you're not there, he knows how to operate and, and the all the equipment. Well, yeah, that we don't we don't really want that to happen, uh, Jerry. We, we we tell them, and again, it's up to them that they don't answer the phone a lot of times, you know, which is hard for them to to swallow. Once it gets into a rhythm, that usually works. So I take it then that the reason that you don't want them to answer the phone when you're not there is that you're considering those phone calls evidence, and now you're worried about the chain of custody. I mean, that, that's a side issue. That might be a side you know, reason. But the primary reason is that we don't want the bad guys, the kidnappers, to call at all hours of the day or night. And, and we don't want that to happen because that that stress that's going to put stress on the family. That's going to, in this case, that's going to put a lot of stress on on Heiko. Well, when are they going to call? You know, are they going to call at four and, and wake me up in the morning? Or are they going to, you know? So we try to we we try to steer the conversations toward a toward a reasonable hour for everybody. And in this case, it was it was late at night for the Philippines, but it was early in the morning. Um, well, I'd, I'd have to go. Yeah, I think it was like what was it now? Maybe ten or twelve hours. So it was reasonable for the kidnappers to call at that time, but it was also uh, reasonable for, for Heichel to, to be alert for the cause at that time and us. So that's primary reason, Jerry. Yeah. Again, we know that these cases, a lot of these cases involving certain groups, you know, happen over the period of months, if not years. So, so we, we, we try to organize it as best as we can and make it the easiest for the for the family, so they don't have to worry about calls coming in at all hours of the day and night. That makes sense. The kidnapper, he's, he's wanting his name to be uh, to, to be Mister So S O. So so now we're talking with Mister So, or not me, but obviously but Heiko is. But Heiko's talking with Mister So, and again we're going around and round with this. In August, we get calls the 2nd, 3rd, the 10th, the 16th. On the 18th, we get another proof of life. We, he's able to talk with, with Jerfa and Kevin again. On the 25th and 26th, we get a call. And again, we're not making any progress negotiation-wise. We're just, they're still demanding exorbitant amounts. Um, they're kind of all over the board. They talk about a half million dollars as a down payment, you know, that type of thing. In September... We get we get three phone calls on uh, the first, and then um, I'm over I'm over in the Philippines at that time, and we we decide that we're going to try to work some uh, what we call third party intermediaries. So I, I travel down to uh, Zamboanga City, which is in the southern part of, uh, of the island of Mindanao, and and I meet with uh, with the the mayor there, and the mayor um, has brokered deals before. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to tiptoe around certain things, but the, you know, the, the guy knows a lot. He knows a lot of people. 
and um, he gets things done with the bad people as well. So he's a right he's a right uh, guy to go to, we think. So we try to we try to get him involved, and he's aware of he he's aware of what's happening. He knows about the kidnapping and everything else because uh, it's making it's making uh, news in a local paper as well. We go to him; he, he agrees to try to help, and he does talk with uh, with Heiko a few times on the phone, just trying to uh, again we're trying to get him to move and use whatever power he has in, in the case. And the next day, we we actually travel to Basilan, which is not really something I. <laughs> wanted to do, but we did it with uh, some protective escort. And we met with the vice governor there. Um, He's right on the island where they operate. He certainly knows what's happening on his island. And, you know, again, these people are influential for reasons. And um, I won't, I'll just leave it at that. Anyway, we meet with him. He's, 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 you know, nice, cordial. He wants, uh, he says he'll help if he gets a visa. (laughs) He can't get a visa to the U.S. So, so his deal is look. So, so he's negotiating too. Yeah, exactly. He's he'll do he'll he'll do what he can, but he'll do a lot more if he gets a visa. Of course, we can't promise him that. And and uh, anyway, but that his motivation was uh, was you know getting a visa to the U.S. We we did it was more a lot of it was due diligence, just trying to do everything we can to to help Kevin and Jirfa. So uh, that's what we did. It really didn't help too much, I don't believe. But again, you know, it's 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 doing what we can to help. That was since early September. Then we get a few calls mid-September. Heiko is, is calling the mayor. They're having conversations. Uh, the mayor of Zamboanga City, which again is in the southern part of uh, Mindanao, and the mayor is doing. He's you know, it's a play, he's a politician, so you know, he's he's helping out, but it's making him look good. On uh, September seventeenth. We had another uh, proof of life. Heiko agrees again to pay another small uh, ransom. Again, it was not really for anything. I think it was, uh, if I can recall correctly, I can go back and look, but I'm pretty pretty sure it was due to threats that he felt he needed to do something. So that's what happens. And and again, we're not getting anywhere when it comes to the negotiations. Uh, We've now made some concessions, and Heiko's trying to use that. We're trying to use that to our advantage in that, you know, he's made payments, um, but he does not have anywhere near the money that they think he has. And we're still stuck in that issue. In October, and again, we're not, we're thinking this is going to go on for a long time, like a long time. So, but uh, in October, another thing happens uh, that changes things. Zirfa is released. He's released on the 2nd of October, kind of out of the blue. Um, it was not a negotiated deal uh, by any means, but can I just ask you a question real quick, Jerry? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think the reason would be for them to release uh, Jirfa? Just Well, what? I would think that as the mother, she is going to do everything in her power to get her son released. So I think they're going to release her to help them get a bigger ransom. Exactly. They they figure, look, we're not getting anywhere with Eichel. You know, why don't you go out and you try to do what you can do? Right? Yeah, yeah. I hadn't read ahead of time in <laughs> case in case anybody thinks I that I did. But I'm thinking as a mother, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get my son home. Yeah, no doubt. Right. What do you think Jirfa thought uh, when when she was woken up early in the morning? And what do you think she thought? I am not leaving here without my son. Absolutely. She, she did not in any way want to go. She was forced to go, but in her mind, she thought she was going to be killed. In her mind, she thought that she was going to be made an example of. And, you know, and you could see that. I mean, I could see that point of view. Do you yeah. think that she was made aware of the executions that, that this group has beheaded people in the past? Did, did um, yeah, you know well, I think she knew that. Uh, th- here's the thing. Uh, the other thing about their captivity, and we didn't really touch on that at all yet, but the other thing, they they were going out, and uh, the group that, you know, th- that they were guarding her, they, they, had, they had patrols going out, and they were engaging, they were engaging uh, the, the Filipino army, you know, regularly. So uh, th- there's a, this is a battle, you know, this is the battlefield down there. So, so she knew what they were capable of. They, they were making explosives in front of her, things like that, you know. So they, they, she knew that they were very dangerous. And, and the other thing is she's Filipino. She knows who they are. I mean, she knows what they're capable of. So, 
Yeah, she, she knows what she, who she's dealing with. And in fact, there was another woman that Kevin and Jerfa came into contact with for a brief period of time, another victim uh, who was taken on, um, on September 4th. She was taken by a different group, same Abu Sayyaf, but a different faction or a different, I don't know what, what, their, what their organization is, but a different uh, group of, uh, of fighters. But they, they, were, they were involved in a you know, running battle with the Filipino military. And on the 19th, a couple weeks later, she was able to escape during one of, this, one of these skirmishes. So she had crossed paths with uh, Jerfa and Kevin uh, for a brief period of time. So she was interviewed and, um, and she helped identify some of the subjects that were involved. All right, so she's released. And then, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking there, there's a lot of downtime. For us uh, back in the states, because it's not really moving that quickly, uh, you know, calls are sporadic. And Heiko did try to get out one at a time rather than all together. You know, that's not really the optimum. We want we want them all out at once, obviously, but that that wasn't working. So we were we were open to a lot of different things, and one of them was getting Kevin out first. Uh, we thought Kevin would probably be more valuable to uh, uh, Abu Sayyaf uh, than, than Jirfa, but and we did try to try to make that deal, but they, they weren't going for it. And, and, you know, that was happening well before Jirfa was uh, let go. But anyway, she's, she's released on the second. And then the other thing is now we have to decide, well, is Jirfa coming to Lynchburg? I mean, if, if you were, if you were released in a foreign land, Jerry, you know, and then a foreign land that you knew that you, you know, you grew up in, would you be inclined to, to go back to it without your son? No, right? No, not at all. Yeah, so we, we surmise that there's no way Jerf is leaving there. And uh, so what happened is, um, for a couple of reasons, we, we decided to move our, what we call the Negotiation Operations Center, the NOC. We, we moved it to Manila because we knew that Jerf wouldn't leave. And we were closer to the crisis site, the crisis site being on Basilan. That would be a lot easier to uh, communicate. We'd be on the same time zone and we'd be close to the embassy and close to resources there. So we, we moved everything over to Manila on the 9th, a week later. And uh, I went over there with, uh, with another negotiator and we set up our shop in a, in a hotel to prepare for calls. How we transition is we advised Heiko to inform, you know, Mr. So that he's to call the number of Jirfa. Did Heiko want to go to the Philippines? Did he go to the Philippines? What was your advice on on that? Heiko did not want to go over there. And one thing I'm not going to do is pass judgment on him. That's just what he chose uh, to do. And, you know, other people would choose differently. But, I mean, from the very beginning, you'd probably have a lot of fathers and husbands, you know, on a plane the next day trying to make things happen. But that just wasn't Heiko's way. And, you know, Hike was left out of the loop a little bit, you know, and, and that was that was tough for him, I'm sure, because he, he was the person talking and he was the person, you know, dealing with Mr. So the whole time, even though we didn't make a whole lot of progress. He still was involved. He was in a loop. And when we left, I'm sure he didn't feel too good about that. But what we did do is we, we tried to talk to Hike as often as possible just to give him, you know, updates as, as you know, as they were occurring. She's out on October 2nd. We moved to the Philippines on the 9th and set up uh, our negotiation center over there. And then we start taking calls and we really didn't get, get that many calls. In. And one of the things that Jerfa did do, though, it was, it was easier for her to communicate with Mr. So from a practical standpoint. We still did not get anywhere with Mr. So. Jerfa did not get anywhere with Mr. So simply because they were hung up on the fact that they were demanding way too much money than the Lundsmans had, and that we never really got off that. What's going on with the cousin? Is he still being held? They don't want him but, anyway. Yeah, the cousin's still there. That's one thing that Jirfa kind of had relief that, that, um, that he was still there to, to be with Kevin. Kevin's 14, and you know Jirfa is not there anymore, so she's, she's grief-stricken, right? And then she's trying to deal with Mr. So, who's threatening to, to sell them to Al-Qaeda. And, you know, Heiko got some pretty bad threats, too, you know, slitting throats, all this stuff. Sometimes it's easy for people to, like, you know, well, if I were in that position, I'd do this or that. But you, you want to pray you're never in this position because you don't know how you're going to react. I try not to pass judgment at all on how they react because I'm not in their shoes. I'm not dealing with, with what they have to deal with. And that's how I look at these things. And if, if people want to pay a ransom, it's up to them, you know? passing judgment on somebody. That's the last thing I want to do. 
And that's what we try to convey to our negotiators. This is not about us. It's not about our judgment. It's not about our values. It's, it's just dealing what you have in front of you with the families, you know, that you, that you're dealt and you're, you're there to try to make it the best for them as possible. And we don't know how this is going to turn out. Uh, we just don't know. And the last thing you want to do is from a negotiator point of view is, is, is second guess yourself and how you reacted or how you dealt with us, uh, you know, with a family or loved ones that are, you know, that are now left with maybe a tragedy. So, but so October is really quiet. You know, we're there helping her and we're meeting with, you know, people from the embassy and, and doing all these other things. And there, there's a couple of things that happens at Mwaga City that are, um, you know, one is there's an explosion there um, that occurs at public gathering. I forgot what it was. It was a festival or whatever. But then the next day when we get a call, um, the, the, the kidnappers reference that and, you know, there's, and she's, you know, and this is what we're capable of type of thing. And so it's putting a lot of pressure on, on Jerfa, but we don't get too many calls at all in October. And then really November, they went dead. They went silent. We, 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 the last call was October 21st in October. And the next call we had was November 26th. So that's over a month. Wow. We're trying to call them too. Don't don't get me wrong. We're we're sending texts because we have the number. We you know that they're calling on. We're sending texts. We're leaving mess messages and, but you know it it's not looking good at all. It's it's looking pretty dismal. And is is the thought that something has happened to Kevin that they can no longer provide proof of life and that's why they're not calling? Is well, is that in anybody's mind? Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, no doubt. We just don't know what's happening. And we don't have a clue. We don't get a proof of life after Jerfa's release. So on the second, when she left and she's, you know, she saw him and she said goodbye to him, that was the last time she saw him. And that's last that's the last time we heard that that he was okay. And that was October second when she was released. November twenty sixth, we get a call. We get we get a call twenty sixth, twenty eighth, and the 29th. It's 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 all about going back and forth over over the money, you know. And Jerp is doing all she can to convince him that that they have no money. And then he says, uh, you know, okay, if that's too much for you, there's nothing to talk about, nothing for us now. He also says, you are fooling us, Mrs. Lundman. You are fooling us. You want us to call you to call you so you can locate us. Uh, you are under instruction by the FBI and the Philippine government who are with you. You know, they're calling her out for dealing with uh, locals and us. This is my word, Mark, my, my word, Mrs. Lunson. You've come to realize that how wrong, that you're wrong to believe those people around you. Goodbye, Mrs. Lunsman. And um, the way he said it didn't sound good. And it was uh, like a finale. Exactly. It was um, it just it did. It sounded odd. And uh, we did get one more call uh, on the six. And again, kind of uh, similar. That's why that's why we'd like to finalize the talk with you now. He's asking for two million dollars. He's asking for five hundred thousand dollar payment or down payment, you know, all, all the same stuff. So during this month, when you're not hearing from Kevin, Jerfa at least knows what life is like in the camp. She is hoping that Kevin is alive. What does she know is happening to him? How is he living? What are they doing during the day while they're being held? They had no training for hostage survival, but they're doing some things that we would advise. They move several times, so they're, they're leaving traces that they were there, um, evidence of themselves, hair, uh, things like that. They're squirreling away food in case they get a chance to escape. They're assessing their chances to escape the whole time. They're doing some things, again, that were almost out of a survival book. But they're, again, they're, they're living day to day with this group. They were mistreated a few times, struck, but overall, nothing that was too crazy. But it's easy for me to say that because I wasn't there. But they weren't being tortured and they were being fed. Yeah, yeah, they, they, were, they were being tended to. They were being fed. And again, they were squirreling away food in case they had an opportunity to escape. Yeah, so they, they did a very, uh, I would say, a very good job. If you're, if you're being uh, held captive, they did some things that we would advise um, everybody to do. They did it all without training. It was just common sense to them. But the other thing that she's doing, I f- forgot to mention, she's providing some valuable uh, intelligence to uh, other entities regarding her captivity, you know, trying to pinpoint where and, and things like that. On the 13th of November, uh, Romnick escaped. So he's out as well. And now it's just Kevin. When is it that the cousin escapes? Uh, the 13th of November. So at least at that time, you are aware that Kevin is still alive. So I, I, 
even though yeah. he's there by himself and left behind by himself, everybody has some hope in the sense that they know he is still alive. He would have been alive through Romnick's uh, observations then. Yeah, for sure. But now you've got this 14-year-old boy, and I've had a 14-year-old boy, as many people listening, and you're thinking, this is a kid, and and how is he going to survive now that he's all by himself? So I guess it's like a roller coaster of hope and then of just utter despair and sadness because he's alone now. guy by the name of uh, Warren Rodwell from Australia, he's kidnapped on the 5th of December. That's kind of making the headlines, but we don't know if it's the same group that's holding Kevin. But uh, he's taken. So that, that was happening at the time. Pretty sure he was uh, executed. Since this is after the fact, maybe you can share this with us. Mm-hmm. But is there any thought or any plans in place of a rescue? Absolutely. But the problem with rescues is it's risky. It's risky to the, to the hostage. Uh, you know, they, they've had rescues there before that have gone awry where hostages have been killed. So, um, yeah, they're they're. You know, they they rescued that that one. There was a skirmish, and well, I don't know if it was a rescue. Actually, it was a skirmish, and again, a hostage. I mentioned mentioned earlier, she escaped. But they're very dangerous. You know, the, statistically, the two most dangerous times for hostages are at the initial hostage taking, and at any potential rescue. So, uh, those are the the worst times for hostages because it's chaos. Right? You're kind of rolling the dice to a degree. They want to rescue people, no doubt, but you have to remember it's it's high. This is a high, highly political area, and where they're they're operating, where where the where Abu Sayyaf is, the Philippine National Police cannot enter there. It's a semi-autonomous region, so the people that are um, kind of representing uh, authorities for the Philippine security would be the military. So it's it's highly highly risky. I'm, I'm sure they would have loved to go gone in and and try to rescue them. Um, it's a small island. I think they have pretty good ideas where these people are hanging out, but it, it never happened because it's, again, it's a, there's certainly no guarantee. But, I mean, there was nothing really going on that uh, that, that led us to believe that there was going to be an agreement anytime soon. And I, you know, I, I, I told people that this is going to go on for a year. This is going to go on for a long time because we were just, we just got nowhere in the months that, that we were talking with them, just didn't make any progress at all. On the 9th of December, then we had just met with Jurfa and nothing had happened that day. And, you know, we were all feeling, wow, this is going to go on for a long time. Christmas is getting close and, you know, we're hoping he's out by Christmas, but, you know, that's never going to happen. Not the way we were going. So on the 9th of December, Kevin escaped. Smart kid. This kid is very bright. If you had to pick a a 14-year-old to be a hostage, he would would be the one that you pick. Bright kid, um, not overly emotional, just a smart kid. And, and he uh, figured out a way to leave. And, and what happened is, uh, you know, he was there for a long time. They, they have their routines. And, and, and that's the other thing that, that a lot of times hostages can exploit when they try to escape is they learn routines and, and they learn certain things. And, and, and maybe through, uh, if, you, if you pay close enough attention and you, you can, you know, figure out the best time to, to try to escape. And that's what happened. Uh, a lot of the folks weren't in camp. They were out doing the, whatever they do. And he was left with a, with one of the, it was an old guy. It was an older guy. And, but you know, he, you know, he'd work with this old guy and, you know, they do things. And the old guy uh, went into a house and I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving out oodles of details, Jerry, but basically what happened, he, he had the opportunity. The guy w- was in a house and um, in, a, in a hut, I don't want to say a house, it was a structure, let's put it that way. He was able to grab a knife and he was able to lock the door from the outside and get away, leaving the old guy inside. He follows a river. He can hear people looking for him. He spends a night out in the jungle. And the next day he, uh, he runs across a guy and, you know, who knows who these people are siding with, right? He meets a guy walking down the road. The guy happens to speak English and he's able to, this guy, luckily he's on, he's on the side of right, recognizes that Kevin needs help. And, and then, you know, he alerts the authorities and, and Kevin's out. So were you in the Philippines at that time? Yeah. Yeah. We had just left. Oh uh, my God. I can yeah. only imagine. I know. It's like, and I, <laughs> I've been, I've been so lucky. We had this one case in, in Colombia where, the guy was in captivity for 16 months, you know, and I'd been down there a couple of times on different deployments and 
I was there when he got out too. It's like, just happened to be, you know, there, which is kind of cool. So anyway, he's out and we had just left uh, Azurfa for the night waiting for the call and nothing had happened and everybody's really glum. And we get this call and we're thinking, holy, you know, he is out. So we hustled back and uh, yeah, we told uh, Azurfa and it was like, it was a complete shock that he had escaped. And, it, and again, we were, everybody was down in the dumps. And I, I tell you what, that's like one of the highlights of, if not the highlight of, of my career being there when that happened. And yeah, it was a really good feeling that he was out, you know, but then you still think he's not, you know, he's not here yet. He's not here yet. But, you know, the military had him. And so it was uh, really good to hear and that he was safe. So they did their uh, they did their rounds. Uh, well, when Jerfa was released, uh, the mayor of Zamboanga City, he you know he did his uh, PR stuff and with photos and everything else. So so when Kevin got out, of course, the same thing happened with him. So the mayor got uh, a lot of publicity out of it. How quick did they get out of the Philippines? They stayed a few more days. Uh, oh, really? Um, yeah, they got a tour of the embassy, met the ambassador. They were given a VIP treatment at the embassy. It wasn't that long; it may be a day or two. I was able to travel back with them to Lynchburg. And we went to Los Angeles first, and the press knew about this, and so the press were waiting, waiting there. We kind of circumvented the press. We got all the way back to Lynchburg, and there was a nice reunion there. A hike was there, and a couple of other relatives and a couple of FBI persons were there, and so it was really good. Yeah, it just came to a surprising ending because, you know, you're still thinking we've got all this negotiation and Kevin could be harmed. And then all of a sudden you get a call. Exactly. It was one of those cases where we thought it was going to, you know, we'd we'd be there a long time and we didn't have a lot of hope. And then out of the blue, uh, Kevin was able to manage his escape. So it was great. This has been a fascinating case review. Uh, Before we move on to just a a few other things that I wanted to ask you about, Mm -hmm. is there anything that you wanted to to tell us to wrap this all up? Yeah, yeah. I I want to go just briefly into the investigation. So it turns out Mr. So, the bad guy, is uh, a law enforcement, military and police background. This is what we find in a lot of cases. Uh, Are you serious? Yeah. So he's um, charged there. We did get uh, uh, photos from ATM withdrawals uh, linked to that account. There was a lot of things that were happening behind the scenes that were helping the identification. ASG leaders, uh, that's Abu Sayyaf group leaders, Isnalan Hapalan and Kair Mundos, they were involved in the uh, negotiation strategy and extortions. Uh, Mr. So, he uh, confesses to be uh, being the, the communicator and receiving the bank account information from Heiko. About 30 individuals were charged in the Philippines. Um, initially, four were arrested. Interestingly, Jerfa did go back and testify in some of the trials back in the Philippines. So she did go back and, and testify against them. Were any of these individuals tried in American courts? Because I know we have the extraterritorial jurisdiction, which allows us to you know, extradite an individual from a foreign country and try them here in the U.S. Did that happen in this case? Yeah, the, the Los Angeles Division was involved. Uh, they had uh, their ET uh, extraterritorial uh, investigator involved. Right now, I don't know the status of that. But at the time, uh, four were being considered by the U.S. Attorney's Office for indictment. But they were all charged in the Philippines, convicted, I know that. Uh, with Jirfa being uh, one of the witnesses. Um, and that's the other thing. We forget that the hostages are excellent witnesses. Obviously, they were there. They saw the people. She, she could identify people by face. She was around it for, you know, a couple months. Yeah, and she did that. She went back and, and uh, testified. We had about 25 negotiators from across the country involved in this case. And those are just negotiators. That's not counting investigators. That's not counting the ET personnel, extraterritorial personnel from Los Angeles. But I'm a negotiator, so I present this from a negotiation angle. The Los Angeles personnel, there's uh, 17 people involved. And then there's uh, other personnel, legal attache personnel, embassy personnel, personnel from Richmond Division, headquarters, victim assistants. So there are a lot of people working in these cases. And that, that's one thing that I want to share is that when someone gets kidnapped in these places, there's a lot of people looking for them. And there's a lot of people working to, to get them out. It's not just a couple people. This is, uh, yeah, and you know this, Jared, that the Bureau responds uh, pretty heavily. I do want to talk a little bit about why you 
decided that you wanted to be a crisis negotiator. I know that you had been a police officer before you joined the FBI, but I'm, I'm looking at your bio here and it was like maybe two years after you became an agent that you went to training to become a hostage negotiator. So you did that for the majority of your career. Yeah, there was a good fortune, probably is the best way to describe it. I was transferred to the Seattle Division out of the Quantico. And a lot of times at, the, uh, at, 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 at that period in time, they sent people with law enforcement experience to smaller, uh, what we call resident agencies or smaller offices. So Spokane, Washington is a, a, one of the smaller offices out of the Seattle Division. So seeing that I had a law enforcement experience, they sent me to Spokane, which at the time was a four-person RA resident agency. So I went there and, and um, shortly thereafter, the Goodwill games were coming to Spokane. So, and we were short of negotiators. And there was another uh, older agent in my office, Ed Burke, that was a negotiator and he kind of got me into it. And then there was, uh, there, there happened to be um, this this uh, kind of a major event occurring in Spokane at the time. So they they wanted to train up some negotiators just in case for as a contingency, because, you know, there's a lot of people from different countries uh, that, that come to these things. So it's not, kind of like a, almost like a mini Olympics and they need a negotiator. So I was able to get in a negotiation course probably before I should have. Uh, usually you need a little bit more experience, but I was able to go and, and that's how I got involved. My coworker was instructing at the time. So he got me into instructing and, and we did some things up there uh, in Spokane as well. Some cases involving bank robberies and Aryan nations, uh, uh, issues going on in that area. So we had a lot of lot of action and where we actually negotiated uh, in certain criminal events up there. So that's how I got into it. Before the episode started, I did read your bio to uh, everyone. And so they, they're aware of some of the huge cases that you were involved in. And they're also aware of the many you know countries that you were deployed to. And I did mention to them also that you received in 2011, the FBI Director's Notorious Achievement Award for Negotiations. This award was for a piracy-related hijacking off the coast of Somalia. I'd love for you to tell us, you know, just give us a, a, a quick review of what that was all about. This involved Captain Phillips in Marisk, Alabama. Happened back in uh, April of 2009 from the uh, April 8th to the 12th. But at the time, there were many hijackings of, of freighter ships and whoever else, not only working ships, but pleasure vessels that, that entered a certain area around Somalia that they had these roving bands of, uh, of pirates and in inflatable boats, basically boarding and taking them over and, and, and guiding them back to, uh, to the Somalia coastline where they were held for huge ransoms from some of these companies. On the 8th of April of, again, this was 09. I don't know exactly how it occurred. If anybody was watching the movie, there were several boats that, that approached. And that one pirate that they depict in the movie was bent on getting aboard the ship. But anyway, it was uh, eventually boarded by four pirates. As this was occurring, they were able to get off some, uh, some warning SOS signals to alert that they were being attacked and ultimately hijacked. There was an altercations on the boat where one of the pirates got injured, and there was a brief standoff where the crew had one pirate that they were holding, and the other three pirates had, were holding Captain Phillips. So they agreed to trade, but the crew gave up their pirate, and the pirates didn't, and they were able to get on a little life craft with Captain Phillips on it, and four and four pirates, and, and they're in the open ocean. And that happened on the 8th. Well, there's a destroyer, a U.S. Navy destroyer, kind of in the area. Uh, they, they hear the distress signal, and they, so they respond at the Bainbridge, the USS Bainbridge. And they get there the 9th, and this, this little raft is not moving very quickly. It's got a tiny little engine on it, and it's kind of putt-putting toward, uh, toward Somalia. We didn't want, obviously, for that boat to get the, to the shore. Then they, then they can hold uh, Captain Phillips there for quite a long time. In this case, we didn't deploy to the Bainbridge. There was dialogue that began, and it began from the Bainbridge, and, and it was done um, initially through a sat phone and um, PA system. But the PA systems are not, you know, they're not the best way to communicate. But anyway, the negotiator who was helping the uh, the officer on board the Bainbridge was a coworker of mine, Vince Alfonso. He was actually feeding him from his home in Virginia. I went up to the Pentagon and worked with the military 
who stood up a situation room at the Pentagon. And we had another, my unit chief, John Flood, he went down to the headquarters of Marisk. So we kind of split things up. Vince was uh, supplying the, uh, the real-time talking points to the officer who was communicating them to the kidnappers. That's how this thing was, uh, was run. And well, some of the things that we did were very basic. Um, you know, we're stalling for time because other assets now are, are being deployed uh, that have skill levels that the people on the brain bridge don't necessarily have. There was a, another boat, the uh, uh, Halliburton, that arrived, and they had the assets that could be used, equivalent of a, like a, a SWAT team. You know, it'd be like uh, it'd be like first responders, uh, police department. They're waiting for other assets, primarily SWAT teams and maybe negotiators, whoever else could help. You know, resolve the situation, uh, peaceful or or other means. So, from a peer negotiation standpoint, for us in assessing this, it is they are trap criminals. Really, they 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 were caught red-handed um, trying to steal a, a ship, <laughs> and now they're caught. But they do have. They do have a hostage as leverage, and, and that was, uh, you know, that, that's the issue, right? But one of the things that we did know, we said, look, if they harm Captain Phillips, they have no leverage at all. It's, it's you know, they might threaten, but if they actually do harm to Captain Phillips, it's, and whether or not that would have happened, or, uh, I don't know. But I think in their minds, they're in the middle of nowhere. They've, they're facing down, a you know, a Navy destroyer and, and another ship that comes upon. So they're thinking, you know, if we harm this guy, we're dead too, right? So we have that playing for us. Vince is speaking with uh, an officer on the Bainbridge who is talking with the kidnappers. So we're not talking directly with the kidnappers, but we're providing them with, with some ideas to, to resolve this. Look, we all, again, we all want the same thing. We want everybody out, you know, including the hijackers. We don't, it's not necessarily we want to kill them. If they would have raised their hands and, and said, we surrender through their guns into the water, whatever, we would try to take them into custody. So that's what we're working for their surrender, and then the release of Captain Philip. If they take actions that would create a different outcome, that's kind of on them, right? So there, there are some very basic things that are going on when it comes to dealing with trapped criminals. Uh, same way in a bank. And you could imagine this, Jerry, if, uh, if now we, we, we're into a day or two of a guy in a bank, they're going to need food, they're going to need water, they're going to need other things. So now we're, we're creating deals, we're creating... Um, opportunities for us uh, in law enforcement, in this case, it was the Navy, to get close to the crisis site. Well, what does it look like? You know, if we do need to do something, you know, how does it look? With the goal of building trust and to try to get them off in a peaceful way. So that, that was being done. All these things are being done. So th that's kind of how the, the strategy went from that angle, from the, the direct communications. The other things we, we did was uh, when I was up at the Pentagon, there was a, a naval officer who happened to be up there who had just got back from Somalia and had developed these really good sources. So he was able to call in real time while it was happening. Basically, we made a recording of some of the elders. They knew who these people were. They knew who the hijackers were. So we tried to get the elders to uh, make, a, make a statement um, and we did. We made a recording uh, to, play, to play to the, the young kidnappers. And these are the tribal elders there. So we thought, well, they, they might have some control or some influence over the, uh, over the younger guys. And so we did that. And we did play it for them. It didn't, it didn't really help, to be honest with you. It didn't help. But that, that's what happened. That, that's how we were playing it from, the, from what we call a third-party intermediary angle. I did see the movie. Did you see Captain Phillips? Yes. And what did you think of it? Is, was there anything in there that uh, you felt from the FBI negotiation side, you know, the information that you were feeding to the military people on the ship that was wrong, that was... Well, they came down and talked with us. The, the, you know, uh, I just don't think what we, <laughs> what we did was exciting. <laughs> so They skipped um, that part in the movie. Yeah, they, didn't, they didn't go into that at all, really, that I could see, that I can recall. But that, you know, that's fine. It, it was primarily a military operation. As we all know from the movie that um, there was a time when snipers uh, were able to have everybody in their sights and, and Phillips in a, in, a, in a place that he was not endangered. So um, simultaneously, they took their shots and killed all three of them. And then uh, Phillips was rescued and that occurred on the 12th. From an FBI standpoint, they reached out to us um, for our guidance and we tried to give them the best guidance we could. I think we did. And then uh, the decision to, uh, to end it was theirs, and uh, that's what happened. And the investigation of the lone Somali pirate to survive, that was handled as an FBI investigation? And, uh, yes. 
Abduwali. He was convicted. We learned that he had, he had been involved in uh, the hijacking of three other vessels. You definitely had a fascinating career. And I know that you retired in 2015. So what are you doing now? Well, I, after I retired, they allowed me to, to come out here. My, my son has some health issues, so I was able to, able to come out. I'm on the West Coast now. I'm in the Seattle area. I was able to come out here and work as a contractor out of the uh, Seattle office, but I still worked for uh, the Crisis Negotiation Unit as a contractor for two years. And then this past, uh, what's going on a year now, last October uh, of 17, that's when my contract expired. And now I've opened up a company, Crisis Negotiators, TCN, and then um, basically I have my own little thing. I, I'm not doing too much right now. I just had some surgery um, on my ankle, so I'm kind of immobile. But, you know, hopefully 19, I'll, uh, I'll get out there and do a few things that I want to do. So would you be working then with some of those private security companies that you mentioned before, helping on the uh, private side, doing some of the same type of negotiations you did as an agent with the FBI? You know, I don't know. I thought about that. Um, but again, those guys are, are out and about all the time. And I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to go to some of these places I've been to before. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I've done a lot. I've traveled around the world a few times. Been and, there, uh, done that. Yeah, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. I wouldn't mind advising if I could from on my own terms. But again, I'm, I'm here to help my son. I don't really need to travel that much anymore. Kind of, kind of nice to settle in one place for a change. We're at the end now, and one of the things that I like to do is give my guest the last word. What would you like to say? Well, again, I think I mentioned it earlier, is that there, there's a lot of people that are out there trying to help people that get into trouble, um, not only in the States, but around the world. And the response from the U.S. government is usually strong, competent, the best you can get. So I would say that uh, in, from a narrow perspective of being a negotiator and from my experience. The other thing I would say from a wider sp perspective is that the FBI in general is comprised of some great people. And they always, I think, have the, uh, the public in mind uh, more than really anything else. And they're task oriented. If they're given a, a job to get done, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen the best way possible. We are public servants. That's what we are. That's what we, a lot of us love to do. And that's what we are doing. So that's what my uh, word would be to the, the folks out there, Jerry. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Mark Thundercloud and newspaper articles about the Philippine and Captain Philip kidnapping cases. There is also a link to an NBC Dateline episode where you get to hear directly from Jerfa and Kevin Lundstrom about their ordeal. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or your favorite podcast app. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for you this week. I'm reading a really good book, but I didn't get a chance to finish it. So I'll have that for you next week. But in the meantime, if you're looking for a good crime novel to read, I hope you'll consider my two crime novels, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, from my Philadelphia Corruption Squad series featuring Special Agent Carrie Wheeler. The books are available at Amazon.com as ebooks, paperbacks, and Pay to Play is available as an audiobook. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.